good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Carlos Diaz. I am the IWA manager of the Climate Smart Utilities Initiative. Uh, welcome to all of you. Thank you very much for, for joining us. To, thank you very much for being here. Um, I am going to... Uh, I am going to moderate uh, this uh, meeting, this meeting of the of the community of practice of the Climate Smart Utilities Initiative. And uh, please, uh, uh, my only request is uh, that all of you please uh, mute your uh, mics if you are not uh, speaking. So uh, welcome and let's uh, get started. Okay, so this is the agenda of today, the welcome and introduction uh, and introduction by, uh, from myself. Then, then we will have a, a short introduction about the Climate Smart Utilities Initiative uh, by, my, by our colleague Brenda Ampoma. Uh, later we will have a, say, a presentation on groundwater use minimizing its ca carbon footprint by Dr. Stephen Foster from University College London. And then we will have two very interesting case studies, this case uh, or case stories, this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, stories we are collecting from, uh, from all over the, all, uh, from, from everywhere. Uh, actually, one, this is one of the main uh, activities of the Climate Smart Utilities Initiative to collect these uh, good cases on adaptation, mitigation and leadership, which are the three pillars of the, of the Climate Smart Utilities Initiative. We will have two interesting case studies, one from Bergen, Norway, uh, by Mari Sagen, and the other one from uh, Manila Water from Philippines, uh, by Sara Vergado. Then we will have a short uh, questions and, uh, and answer session uh, and, uh, moderated uh, by myself. Then we, will have, then we will have the breakout rooms and uh, cl closing remarks. What are the objective of this meeting? This is, this is the meeting of the community of practice of the Climate Smart Utilities Initiative. And the objectives are to learn about adaptation and mitigation actions in different water utilities, to understand the experiences and challenges of practitioners in implementing these climate actions, and to discuss possible outputs for the community of practice. What can you contribute to the COP, right? Because as you know, this community of practice is one or maybe the main a component of the initiative. And we are really relying on you to learn about climate actions and adaptation actions. And this is very important for us. And we are paying a lot of attention to revitalize this community of practice, okay? So say that, say, that, say, say that I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Brenda Apoma, to go through the Climate Smart Utilities Initiative. Uh, Brenda, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Carlos. Um, as Carlos has already mentioned, my name is Brenda Ampoma from the International Water Association, and I'm based in Ghana. So before we move on to our main speakers, for today, I will be sharing with us a brief introduction on what the IWA Climate Smart Utilities Initiative is all about. So to begin with, this initiative is a legacy of an IWA GIZ project known as the Wackling Project, and it supports utilities around the world to work collectively to win their race to resilience. So basically, the goal of the initiative is to assist in climate resilience within utilities through climate adaptation and then also mitigation. Now, with the climate, with the changing climate, we are all experiencing the effect of this um, changing climate. And for this reason, we need collective actions with measurable outcomes. You also agree with me that we are in a race against ourselves. And the only way that we can win this race is together. And we believe that utilities can take a lot of actions towards global decarbonization and are also key to city successful climate adaptation. So when we say um, an IWA climate smart utility, what do we mean? Now, these are water, wastewater or urban drainage utilities that are improving their climate resilience while contributing to significant and sustainable reduction of carbon emissions. And these can be public utilities, private utilities, or a mixture of these companies who advocate for climate action. So the initiative has four main components, and one of which is the reason why we have gathered here, 
um, knowledge sharing through a community of practice that supports um, exchange of um, knowledge among technical expertise. We also have an information repository component, a utility engagement component, and then an awareness um, raising campaign component. So under knowledge sharing, we have put together a community of practice that we have been organizing meetings, webinars, and master classes to share knowledge on what we are doing as utilities. And then we also have a platform on IWA Connect, which is a IWA social media page. And um, that's um, people interact among themselves. So if you are not a member of the group and then you would like to be a member, um, please visit IWA Connect and then you can join the platform and then contribute to the, the, the discussions that are going on on the page. So basically the community of practice platform provides um, an opportunity to exchange on common problems, to share knowledge on solutions, inspire innovation, and then also create a, knowledge, a storehouse of knowledge on two main topics. The first being climate adaptation in asset management and planning. And then the second on mitigation or reducing carbon footprint of assets. So we have, we have on, on IWA Connect, we have separate group for climate adaptation, and then we have separate group for reducing carbon footprint. But then in the future, we are trying to merge all these groups to become one major group on climate smart utilities. So the first group on adaptation, we had a first kickoff meeting somewhere last year on 24th of March. And then the outcome of this meeting was to identify some priority areas that we felt um, we could um, share knowledge on and experience when we are talking about climate adaptation. Now, one of their priority areas was to have a platform to share best practices, case studies and research. And currently we have a website that we are updating constantly with some best practices, case studies from different utilities. We also consider the need to gather and map information on climate financing pathways. We also consider the need to share experience with people working with regulators to incentivize resource adaptation approaches and then also to promote information on tools that can support adaptation. And under tools to support adaptation, we also had a webinar last year on, on climate adaptation tools. Another priority area we consider important was to showcase some adaptation actions. And under this, as Carlos said in the introduction, we are collecting case studies on some adaptation actions that are implemented by utilities for other people to also learn what is being done when we are discussing climate um, change. So under the group on reducing carbon footprint, same as adaptation, we also had a kickoff meeting in December last year, and then also identified some priority areas, one of which was to have a shared tool and approach for greenhouse gas monitoring. Under this, we have also created a subgroup that with people who are interested in greenhouse gas monitoring. So if you are interested, um, please, um, go on IWA Connect and then join this group and also contribute to the um, fruitful discussions or activities that are going on within this particular group. We also consider it necessary to have a platform to share experiences on low carbon approaches and specific technologies or challenges. Um, as it is being done for the adaptation, we are using the website to also um, share information on case studies and best practices, experiences amongst um, utilities. We also consider the need to have um, financial incentives to invest in green technologies and then also to have defined goals for climate neutral utilities. So these are the different areas we have identified under both adaptation and mitigation. And we will encourage all of us, if you are doing any project or any assignments within this group, please feel free to contact us and then we will provide you the platform to share your knowledge to the wider community of practice group. So under the information repository component, as I said earlier on, we have a website, which is www.climatesmart.org. And we are occasionally updating this website with a um, lot of resources. If you log on to the website and then you click on the library page, you will see a lot of resources there. So we also advise you to visit the website and then make use of the resources that we are constantly uploading. And you can also submit your own resource by using the submit a resource button, and then you send the resources to us. Also, if you want to send it directly to us too, 
Um, you can also send it to my email address. I'll put it in the, uh, the chat box and then we will always upload these resources onto the website. So we also have another component um, called the utility engagement. And the objective of this component was to establish a community with ex utility executives for them to share their expertise, challenges and solutions to empower them to be leaders and also advocate for climate action. Now under awareness um, campaign, IWE has developed a shared vision with committed utility leaders around the world um, to support utilities on their climate smart journey. And um, somewhere last year, a call was made to all utilities for them to endorse um, the vision, which will serve as a guide to innovation, tools and knowledge exchange to support utilities on their climate smart journey. We believe that once you endorse the vision, you act as a champion to provide inspiration and momentum for all utilities to achieve a cultural shift on the three interconnected pillars that was talked about by Carlos, which is adaptation, mitigation, and then leadership. Now, last on the slide is the recognition program that has been developed by IWBA to recognize um, utilities on their climate um, journey. Now, we have opened uh, the applications, and if you are interested, please submit a, an application. If you are doing anything that is related to um, climate adaptation and mitigation, we also have a travel grant available for utilities from developing countries. And the plan is that we want to recognize these outstanding utilities during the IWA World Water Congress, which is slated to happen from 11th to 15th September. So if you want to find out more about the initiative, next slide, please. Please visit any of the website that has been displayed on the screen here, or you can contact our programs and engagement manager who happens to be a moderator for this meeting. And then he'll be more than happy to provide you any information that you want that is related to the initiative. So that being said, we will move on to the main presentation for today which will be presented by um, Dr. Stephen Foster, who is the IWA Groundwater um, Chair. Um, he has an extensive international experience in groundwater assets and management. And as I said, he is the current chair for the Groundwater Management Group and a visiting professor at the University of London. Um, over the years, too, he has also held other senior positions such as the World Health Organization Groundwater Advisor for Latin America and the Caribbean. He has also been the director for British Geological Survey Divisional and then the World Bank Groundwater Management Team Advisor. And he will be presenting on groundwater use and minimizing its carbon footprint. So Dr. Stephen Foster, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Brenda, for your kind introduction for your invitation to join this group. Um, next, please. Um, in one sense, groundwater resources are well um, indicated as a major re resilient resource for use in climate adaptation where they occur. There are two reasons for this. They have generally very high microbiological and for the most part chemical quality. And secondly, the aquifer systems have very large storage and are not vulnerable to climate variation in the short term. But there are problems if, we, if aquifers become polluted, for example, it can be very persistent and, and remediation is problematic. I'm using India as an example of the variability of groundwater storage and therefore the ability of aquifers to play a role in climate change adaptation for utilities. And I give, give here a section of the Indo-Gangetic Plain across Punjab, where you can see absolutely enormous resources um, uh, that really do not respond um, to short-term perturbations of climate. The groundwater is always available. In contrast, um, and at a different scale, the real scale is in the very small box in, uh, on the, uh, left, on the uh, right of the picture, uh, a, se a section across it, it, Peninsular India, where there are, there are aquifers, they're highly used, but they're very low in storage by comparison. So we 
really need to characterize aquifers in terms of their resilience to climate um, through assessment of storage, their productive capacity, and indeed their pollution vulnerability. I wanted now to go to the other side of using groundwater more for climate change adaptation, namely the issues of the nexus with energy use and carbon footprint, which is relatively poorly understood and documented at this point in time. And this is our, uh, the, our specialist group's current um, knowledge of the subject. In public water supply, energy consumption is for source pumping, conveyancing to demand centers and any, any necessary treatment. Now for groundwater, if you've got good water well design and energy efficient pumping, and that means optimum depths of wells, good screen design, pump dimensioning and, and, and regular maintenance, these uh, costs can be relatively modest. Um, and the US have recently published some typical water well use, use um, energy uses at around 0.53 kilowatt hours per cubic meter, which equates to about 220 grams of carbon dioxide per cubic meter. So the positives of groundwater and energy use context are sources close to demand, usually needing only simple treatment. But the negatives are pumping lifts. And if pumping lifts get out of hand and aquifers are not managed to become overexploited, these, uh, these can become a, a, a real problem. But, and I have to just divert to irrigation here. I know it's not the primary interest of the utilities, but the issue of, of the uh, carbon footprint of groundwater use is mainly related to irrigation use. And this uh, groundwater irrigation compares very unfavorably to gravity fed surface water systems, obviously. Uh, groundwater use for crop irrigation has increased enormously in the last uh, 50 years or so. And the first figures here on China, there's now about 100, a uh, thousand million cubic meters per annum extracted for, for irrigated agriculture and pumping is an average depth of, for, from an average depth of now as, as high as 70 meters, generating about 33,000 million kilograms of, of carbon dioxide per annum. USA have been looking at this as well. Their aquifer depletion is, is, is also uh, running quite high in the Midwest and, and, and in California. But they also note that the mobilization of bicarbonate to the surface from aquifers adds to the carbon problem. And there's some figures there on that, on that issue that they've recently published. Uh, perhaps the most difficult situation all is in India. Groundwater use um, is put at 122 to 199,000 million uh, cubic meters per year for irrigation. And aquifer depletion results in the emission of a large amount of, of, of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Latest figures are 45 to 62,000 million kilograms per annum. This is uh, based on 70% electric pumps, 30% diesel pumps, uh, but this constantly falling water table is the problem. Pakistan in a similar situation, um, and the figures are there for, for, for that country also. Next slide, please. So we, reach a conclusion that on the one hand, large groundwater st storage and naturally good quality are a, a major factor in favor of greater use by the water utilities of groundwater in their attempts at climate change adaptation. But there are complications and the complications are that should groundwater become uh, polluted or should it become overexploited, then that carbon uh, 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 carbon footprint uh, changes quite uh, radically and, and, and rapidly. Um, I've used the banking analogy here to illustrate the balance of aquifers, um, income investment and expenditure as opposed to recharge, uh, storage and discharge. Um, but large storage has proved in the past to be a policy curse more than a policy blessing in groundwater because there's a lot of political complacency uh, and people tend, tend to think that uh, all aquifer use is sustainable, and that's obviously not the case. We are facing quite major overexploitation problems in um, uh, South Asia, China, um, the Middle East, Southern Europe, parts of the USA, and in parts of Latin America. So it's a widespread problem now, and only just in its infancy in terms of it being addressed by the uh, regulatory agencies. And 
we have to recognize that water utilities are a major groundwater stakeholder if they if they um, invest in groundwater for climate change adaptation and they need to become more involved with sustainable management and effective protection next slide please so uh, just to summarize if we want to keep the carbon footprint of groundwater use down we need to conserve groundwater quality and prevent pollution where it's being used as a, an important source of water supply we need to have optimum water well designed to ensure energy efficient pumping and we need to act along with the regulatory agencies to reduce and avoid groundwater over exploitation and falling water table um, and that particularly applies where there is competition for groundwater between water well irrigation and a, 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 a water utility use for public supply. Next slide please. Um, so the management challenge uh, is a long-standing one now. Groundwater resources for too long have been abandoned to chance and business as usual will lead to further degradation. The government role must be transformed, it is being transformed in many, many countries, but not enough, to the promoter, not from, from the promoter of short-term development to the long-term resource guardian. There's a widespread, uh, widespread need to strengthen governance through building effective institutions, creating an adequate base, making essential li linkages and aligning financial incentives. Implementing management plans, with appropriate monitoring and assessment provides the basis for adaptive management in response to climate change. And what are utilities have a critical role to play here as a major stakeholder for the potable water supply function. So that's, I think, enough to start. Um, just to summarize, groundwater, a major potential uh, aid in climate change adaptation for water utilities, but it needs management to achieve that and to keep the carbon footprint down in using it for that function. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, for an excellent um, presentation. Please, if you have any question for Dr. Foster, please um, already start putting the question in the chat box. And um, as I said earlier on, um, after all the presentations, we will have um, a section dedicated to attend, respond to all the Q&A questions. And please direct your question to a particular speaker so we can be, be able to respond to it faster. Um, we will move on to our second speaker, who is Marie. Um, she will be presenting on Bergen's water actions in a changing climate. Now, Marie is a climate change and sustainability coordinator at the Bergen Water in Norway. Previously, she has worked as a manager of technology and business development at the startup Invert Apu and at the headquarters of the International Water Association. Her background includes experience from the Danish Environmental Protection Agency, Oslo Water Utility, and also an ambassador for the young water professionals for the International Water Week. So, Miss Marie, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brenda. Thanks for organizing and thanks for having Bergen here today to share our story and both the, our actions in and towards a changing climate. Uh, many of you might not have heard of Bergen before. Uh, we're a smaller city, but we're the second largest city in Norway on the West Coast. And in fact, the rainiest city in Europe. So uh, almost it's around three meters of precipitation per year, which is quite a lot um, here in Europe. Uh, a utility is serving around 300,000 people and we're a full water cycle utility. That means both drinking water, wastewater and drainage. So we manage all the water from the mountains uh, to the fjords, to, also through the city, of course. Um, Bergen, of course, we follow the national goals through the Paris Agreement. Uh, but in addition, the Bergen municipality has some uh, added extra more ambitious goals. Uh, we have a goal for 2030 to be fossil free. So all the emissions, uh, there should be zero emissions within the um, municipality's border. In addition, there's a 2050 goal to be at one and a half degree city, which is even more ambitious. So all our actions within the city, within the municipality should make sure that we're not exceeding global warming more than one and a half degree. Next slide, please. Bergen Water received last year, 2021, the Norwegian Water Sector Sustainability Award. Uh, a lot of this, of course, linked to, to our climate mitigation uh, efforts and are listed here to the right. Uh, already today, we are 60% self-sufficient with energy, uh, mainly through our biogas treatment plant from our wastewater sludge, but also through 
hydropower turbines from our intakes to our water treatment plants. That is something we're also looking at expanding as well, both of these. Uh, already from 2018 to 2020, we had 15% energy reduction. And we're looking also even more through this um, uh, energy management system we have to reduce this even, even further, but a lot of lowering temperatures and having smart systems in place here. We also use a lot of no dig solution. So instead of digging up the pipes when we need to do renewal, uh, there's a lot of technology here to save both costs and the time and energy. And also the, of course, the citizens living around with a lot of noise. So definitely our preferred solutions and uh, a large amount of our projects are no dig solutions. We strongly believe in the circular economy. Sorry, your last slide still. Okay, uh, so we are all our biogas, 100% of it goes to uh, local buses. I think the production now equals around one bus going seven to six times around the earth, uh, just to put the numbers in perspective. And all our biosolids goes as fertilizer to farmers. We also developed our own climate footprint tool. We started uh, this in 2018 as a path to become uh, climate neutral. And this climate footprint tool includes tier three. So also the the production, the emissions from production and transportation of, of everything we need. We had a 35% reduction of our climate footprint uh, from 2018 to 2020. A lot of this comes from our biogas treatment plant being new and being optimized in production. And a lot of it also things I already mentioned here, but in addition, we also, because of the climate footprint rule and results, we saw the effects of swapping out chemicals and swapping out, for example, filter materials at our drinking water treatment plants. And this has had a great effect as well. Next slide, please. Another thing we've been doing is our zero emission construction sites. This is fairly new. Uh, Bergen Municipality now has a goal that all municipal construction sites should be zero emissions from 2025. And we started with our first one in 2020. This means that all the machinery bit on site uh, for construction are electric. Uh, and what we see, which is great already, is that we can see the demands from the municipality creates ripple effects beyond the municipality, also for more the private sector, because the entrepreneurs can, they have um, predictability so they can buy the machinery and use this on other projects as well. We're also collaborating with the local energy company for mobile charging. So we have containers that can be moved around for enough energy at the right spots at the right uh, time. Next slide, please. Then we're moving more to the climate adaptation part, just a nice image here from a local newspaper, a vision for Bergen in 2045, with a lot of blue and green infrastructure, a lot of sustainable urban drainage systems. Next slide, please. So I've seen this journey, of course, as others as well. This is the trend. We've seen it from around maybe the 1960s, as this figure as it mentions. It's uh, stormwater management has been moving from just being pure flood management to being much more complex and much more uh, much more interesting with all its added co-benefits. We've been looking more at recreation and aesthetics, water pollution and water quality, daylighting of streams, the ecology of the recipient, stormwater as a resource, which is very, very important to us. And of course, also robustness, microclimate, et cetera. So you can see maybe this transition from this upper part, just, just to flood, uh, moving below to more livable cities. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are some quotes from our 2006 overall um, overall plans, like water utility plans. Uh, but uh, we can see this is important things that have been shaping us all through the years, although this is 16 years ago. It's very important in Bergen that we give the stormwater time and space. Uh, and we see stormwater as a valued resource and it should be used as a positive element in urban planning. And uh, back then we said water engineers, urban planners and landscape architects should communicate more. And they have, like there's been a lot happening in the last few years and increasingly so. If you take the next slide, please. Because stormwater management is so much about collaboration across the different sectors and different stakeholders, which that's why we always had an integrated approach in Bergen. And um, uh, of course, we have a lot of interdepartmental and interdisciplinary co collaboration within the municipality. We also have this uh, interdepartmental stormwater forum, in, but it's not enough just within the municipality, uh, which the utility is part of. We also work with external stakeholders such as regions and development, universities, with citizens, and we had a lot of trainings to create ownership to all them 
rules and requirements and the guidelines that also the city has been developing. To the right, you can see some of the, an illustration of some of the complexities of Norwegian stormwater management. Next slide, please. Yeah, further on the integrated approach, as I mentioned before, it, it can happen with great ideas, but you also need to make some specific requirements to make sure this is actually followed up. And that's been the great part of Bergen. It's been taken seriously since 2006. Water and wastewater is part of the framework plans, which anyone who builds anything in our city has to submit. So water always needs to be part of it. And we can see this increasing understanding that we need to adapt to the water, not, uh, not the other way around. In 2019, we got our municipal stormwater management plan, which further really spells out and makes it clear how stormwater should be integrated in all land use planning. And, and it's also written that, um, and it's also stated here clearly, uh, once and for all, that blue green infrastructure is the first choice. And that's also part of the framework plans now. So anyone who builds anything needs to argue if they're not using blue and green infrastructure uh, in the city of Bergen. Next slide, please. Just some examples here. Uh, this is from a local school with a blue-green concept. Great with all the rain in Bergen, also for playing. Next slide, please. Another one here with a local park that used to have a bird channel that's now been daylighted. It's a beautiful river park that also explains the history here. And um, yeah, a great recreational area for, for the local residents here. Next slide, please. Then it's uh, Mindebyen, which is an exciting area, around two kilometers long. Uh, it's being developed right now. It's a former industrial area being turned into a residential area uh, with the metro line being opened to go through the entire area and a channel that's been, it's been buried. It's, this is a local low point in, in the area. So it's obviously where the water will go also with the flood. So we're not only reopening the channel and making it a nice recreational area, and next to the bike lanes and everything as you can see here. And it even will be a um, migration route for, for local trout, but there'll be a double channel. So there'll be one underneath that can handle up to a 200 year interval um, uh, rainstorm. So we'll have enough capacity for the bigger floods, but also still have something that works and is, is beautiful and adding something positive to, to the everyday of the residents and people coming through. There's also be a water square, a lot of green roofs and urban greenery and blue and green infrastructure has really been a focus point in developing this, this new area. Next slide, please. So everything that Bergen's done so far, it's never been alone. I think the collaboration we had with other EU partners has been very, very crucial for us. We've been continuously part of EU projects since for a long time. The ones have been most relevant for um, stormwater management are mentioned here. First Mare, then Bingo and Latest Begin, which is what, about blue-green infrastructures through social innovation with the all about how we together can build more resilient and livable cities. Uh, next slide, please. I will not go into all the details here, but uh, if you go to the Begin webpage, you can find a lot of great materials on stormwater management and all the co-benefits and the complexities and how you can create all the great win-win situations with stormwater, and one on social innovations for delivering blue and green infrastructure, one on health and blue and green infrastructure, one on biodiversity. And there's also tools for how you can try to calculate uh, calculate uh, in monetary terms some of these co-benefits. We tried with Bergen's and of course there's uncertainties, but it looks like um, through the work in Begin and, and the Mindemuyen, you could, if you add up the cost, not only for flood, but all the co-benefits, it would amount to around 33 uh, million, uh, million euros. Uh, some of the pictures here are from the meetings, which is one of the great parts of these kind of collaborations. We meet city to city and talk directly to people in other cities that work with the same challenges as you, get a lot of inspirations and good solutions. A bit like, again, why we're here today with communities of practice is a great way to make things happen. We're here to share and try to accelerate our successes. Down to the right is some pictures illustrating this interactive art installation that's soon coming in Bergen through Begin. Uh, that's uh, visualizing precipitation and explaining about climate change is going to be on our main square here in Bergen. And it's a result of uh, a, a, the local newspaper having a competition and a, a, an idea from a 14 year old boy. So very excited to see that as well. And there's also paper on art and blue and green infrastructure in, in the Begin uh, on the web page there. Yeah, I think that was everything I had to say. Thank you very much for having me here and looking forward for the discussions. Thank you.
thank you, Marie, for an excellent um, presentation. And I must say that you, you are doing some great work out there. Um, congrats to you. Uh, if you have any question for Marie, please put the questions in the chat box and in the Q&A, and she will respond to all the questions. So our last presentation is going to be from Sarah, who will be presenting on how Manila Water is building climate resilience. Now, Sarah Bergado is the sustainability head of Manila Water Company, and she is responsible for environmental, social, and gov governance strategy and performance reporting. Prior to her appointment, she has also held various roles in the organization, spanning from areas of operation, quality management, program management, human resources, and customer service. So Ms. Sarah, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, good evening uh, from the Philippines. Thanks, Brenda, for the introduction. I hope you can hear me well. Marie was a tough act to follow, but I hope I can share about Manila Water's adaptation and uh, mitigation action items uh, in response to um, the global issue of climate change. So let me just uh, paint the context for uh, Manila Water and how we operate. Next slide, please. Yeah, okay. So um, the Philippines is tagged as the, from Green Watch, it's tagged as the fourth country that's most uh, vulnerable to climate-related risk. So if you can see, um, we have it all, floods, typhoons, droughts and sea level rise because the Philippines is an archipelago um, with 7, 000, more than 7,000 islands. And maybe to make the, the conversation more interesting, I'd share my personal story on having experienced also of this, the impact of um, massive flooding. Um, a couple of years ago, well, actually 10 years ago, um, we live in a valley and um, we just bought a new house, being newly married. And um, a week before we transferred to that new new house, there was a there was a storm and um, it flooded. Uh, and the first thing that we had to do was a couple was to clean the mud out of the house. And of course, it's very upsetting. But um, upsetting is an understatement because as we went around. Um, a day later, being part of the emergency response of um, our company, uh, the devastation was really more, um, more massive than what we have experienced in our, in our property. Uh, in, in the communities that we went to, uh, the streets were barely passable and houses up to the third story of their houses was filled with mud. And can just uh, imagine the stories where um, people had to be rescued from the from the rooftop. So that's the scenario um, here in in the Philippines. We experience uh, typhoons up to uh, twenty on the average per year uh, passed by the Philippine area of responsibility. Eight to nine um, tropical cyclones make the landfall. And um, as a result of climate change, uh, the winds um, are can be up to more than 170 kilometers per hour. Um, it's uh, aside from that uh, massive rainfall, we also experience uh, drought uh, and uh, sea, level, sea level rise, especially in our coastal community. So we also have operations in um, other islands of the of the Philippines, and uh, people living in the coastal communities amount to um, more than thirteen million people as of twenty twenty data. So this is the the scenario um, here in the Philippines: the impact of um, uh, natural calamities and, of course, of climate change. Next slide. So there, so um, Mandela Water, um, it's actually a private uh, company in the Philippines. We serve in Manila alone. We have um, 
we serve up to 7 million customers, but including the other business units across the, the archipelago um, and also in um, other countries, uh, it's around 12 million. We've been uh, around since uh, 1997 when the water sector uh, was uh, privatized. Manila Water is more known for our uh, social impact, bringing water to um, the communities. Uh, so this year is actually our 25th year um, in August. So uh, just a quick story. Um, only 26% of uh, Manila was served with 24-7 water uh, at that time in 1997. But now uh, 100% of the Manila um, concession is now served with 24 hours um, water, water service. Yeah, so while our uh, programs are geared more uh, towards the social, we also recognize um, the need for uh, a focus uh, on the environment uh, because, of course, the, this is where we get the raw water sources uh, that we treat. So Manila Water was actually one of the, well, it's the first company in, in the Philippines to adopt a climate change policy in 2007. But uh, if you can see, I just quickly summarized uh, the contents of that policy. But you will notice that um, majority of our statements are really geared primarily towards adaptation. Uh, this is also in line with the Philippines that we really have to emphasize adaptation, but closely following that are our climate uh, mitigation efforts. And of course, this can only be done through cap capability building and uh, partnerships with the various sectors of uh, society. We also have a published um, climate change report. Uh, so that's available also in our website. Okay, so on to our adaptation measures. So what we're currently doing is really to secure first um, our raw water sources. Um, for the Manila concession, we have a dem demand supply master plan until uh, our concession period on 20, 2046. And this is updated every five years through our rate rebasing um, exercises. In that plan, we outline our uh, plans to, uh, for new water sources so that we can ensure the public that we serve that we have enough water. Um, currently, this is a challenge because our Manila concession still has a, a deficit, uh, but we are working on it uh, by uh, constructing new uh, water treatment plants. Of course, in partnership with the government that is um, in charge of uh, looking for uh, new water sources to serve the growing population um, of the cities and municipalities in the Philippines. So overall, we have disclosed um, a target up to 2025 that we must have 15% uh, buffer um, across all the, all the business units, all the communities uh, that we serve. So aside from that, we also need to ensure that our um, facilities um, are resilient towards uh, various natural disasters as well as uh, climate change. So um, for the past years, we have conducted a resiliency and a business interruption study. So that includes um, various uh, scenarios such as uh, tropical um, cyclones of uh, over 170 uh, kph, um, also considering uh, sea level rise, and it also includes the uh, earthquake, uh, although not part of uh, climate change, but it's also considered um, in the study, particularly a magnitude of 7.2 um, earthquake. So um, just last year, we've also, um, we are also trying to align to uh, TCFD and uh, a climate scenario assessment is um, currently 
uh, underway. So all of this, um, all of the studies, of course, uh, we use as a baseline so that we can um, proceed or implement uh, programs and projects to re retrofit and rehabilitate our existing facilities to withstand all the all the risk the all the risks that were mentioned earlier. Okay, so just examples of uh, the facilities. This one is a 10 MLD uh, Olandes uh, wastewater treatment plant. It's actually uh, an Iowa Honor Awardee for project innovation. So if you will notice it's uh, built on stilts with the control room um, on, on the second floor. And uh, the, the, uh, the wastewater facility is actually underground. Uh, if you can turn to the next slide. So um, when that flooding happened, uh, we were able, this, the facility was able to, to survive because this is right beside uh, the river. So another example of a facility that is on stilts, this is the 11 uh, MLD uh, Poblacion uh, sewage treatment plant. Okay. Okay, so um, apart from rehabilitating and continuously improving our facilities, uh, we are also keen on emergency response. So we have uh, under construction our um, eight online emergency reservoirs. So this one can um, serve actually up to 5,000 evacuees in, in times of crisis. It can uh, give water to around 5,000 individuals for three days. So it's um, around 50 to 100 uh, cubic sized um, emergency reservoir. Mainly this was designed for an earthquake, um, but of course, in terms of other calamities, it can also be used. Okay, um, another is we have invested also in mobile uh, treatment plants. Um, this uh, gets water from uh, various uh, sources. So whenever uh, supply, uh, water supply is interrupted, uh, we can um, uh, drive this mobile treatment plant and uh, provide water to the communities. The, the only challenge here is that um, we have to transport this uh, between islands. Um, so, so it has to fly in an aircraft as well. But um, it has been helpful as several typhoons have um, de de devastated uh, the southern parts of the Philippines. So this one was able to bring relief to, to the communities there. But of course, at the heart of um, climate adaptation is that your um, employees and your partners, the people are uh, prepared uh, mentally, physically to respond to various um, crises and calamities. So there are drills being conducted. We have a business continuity team that ensures that they can respond to um, any disaster that might happen. And in partnership with our business uh, continuity team, we also have our foundation. This is our social, corporate social responsibility arm that uh, also responds by providing potable water and hygiene kits to um, to the ones affected by the calamities. Uh, this is through their program called Agapay. Agapay means to help or to, um, to assist. Okay, so for our um, mitigation, uh, we try to keep our non-revenue water at the lowest level uh, possible. So our target is to hit uh, less than 15%. So this is both an adaptation and a mitigation uh, measure. Uh, adaptation because we uh, are being resource efficient and we can push more water to the communities. So uh, again, our target is to keep it uh, really low at less than 15%. 
And uh, of course, uh, we to mitigate the risk of um, uh, raw water quality deterioration because of uh, climate change, as well as soil erosion, uh, we also protect our watersheds. We have um, a total of eight. Uh, around the Philippines. We have our integrated watershed management uh, plan. And we also partner with the local government, the national government, and also with the indigenous people that live in the community. So the indigenous people are actually the ones who patrol um, the area and uh, uh, mitigate um, behaviors that are harmful towards the environment. And they are also our partners in uh, planting and nurturing the forest in, in, the, in the area. Okay, so uh, also part of our watershed protection, we involve our employees and the communities and we uh, plant trees that are endemic to, to the area. And then, of course, uh, we uh, purchase and have on-site renewable energy to um, uh, address uh, our emissions as well. So last year, we have uh, purchased around 20% of our usage in, in, in the Manila concession. So we are investing more um, and, of course, trying to... Um, also, the challenge is the infrastructure in, in the Philippines. But um, still, we, we try our best. And uh, we have um, two major facilities, uh, one to 2.5 megawatt facilities that are uh, being explored. So hopefully next year, we can harness more um, renewable energy. Yes, and so uh, energy efficiency initiatives um, for our Manila concession, we started uh, early around uh, from 2013. Um, in terms of our distribution network, we try to use gravity lines uh, so that we will not uh, use more uh, energy in pumping. Uh, Manila is, uh, as well as our other areas, uh, they are uh, rolling terrains. So we try to utilize uh, uh, gravity and design our network system uh, in a way that is energy efficient. So we also have demand-based network management. We, we test uh, our pumps uh, regularly. Uh, as for the offices, we replaced with LED lighting and um, also the air conditioning units we have converted to inver uh, inverted uh, units. Um, for the, our other business units, uh, we're also doing the same at present. And uh, part of that is also um, our wastewater uh, treatment. As we expand our wastewater coverage, we are also helping the country reduce uh, its greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, it's also aligned to the Philippines national uh, uh, contribution um, for uh, greenhouse gas reduction. Okay, so moving forward. Okay, so um, in the pipeline, we are uh, developing our net zero strategy, uh, aligning to the SPTI standards. But the, in the interim, we are um, uh, we have committed to a 60% reduction on our scope one and scope two emissions by 2025. Um, uh, still, it's not enough. So we will uh, realign our targets uh, further. And um, also in terms of our watershed, we are currently doing our forest uh, carbon accounting. And we would like to emphasize as well that in our adaptation and uh, mitigating strategies, um, uh, we perform relentless communication, uh, primarily towards uh, the employees so that we can always get their full involvement in all, uh, in all sustainability um, activities, um, 
uh, no less than our uh, president have also frequent dialogues with the employees and to our external stakeholders. He's the one driving the sustainability um, agenda as well. So, um, and we, we uh, also partner with, of course, with the local government and involve them in uh, all our activities. Okay, uh, I think this is the last slide. All right, okay. So uh, that's it for Manila Water and I welcome any questions that uh, you might have later on. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, please, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat box. I will hand over to my colleague Carlos to lead us in the Q&A discussion. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the three amazing presentations and also for the questions that we are receiving via the chat box. Please don't forget to send your, your questions or otherwise you can also request to not to give you the floor to address your questions uh, uh, to the speakers. Let's uh, go, let's, uh, let's uh, uh, address the first question by Juliette Willett. Uh, I was interested to understand what has been the additional cost to ensure climate resilient facilities as compared with business as usual. For instance, in the case of Manila, right, this, uh, this a sewage treatment plant showed that could survive a typhoon uh, or on the coast. How have, how have you decided how much to invest given uncertainty of climate change. And this is very interesting because we are actually, uh, we are actually organizing this uh, uh, regulator forum in the Congress and, and, and it's all about increased uncertainty and how to decide on costs, right? Because most of the time regulators are busy trying to set the tariff and increased costs me means increased risk, right? And so it's very interesting question. So please, I think the question is addressed to Sara first. So Sarah, if you want to elaborate on, on this. Yeah, it's, it's, it's true that we really have to work with our regulators. Uh, fortunately, there is a, a five-year um, exercise. It's called the rate rebasing exercise where in we can um, revise uh, the plans. Um, but indeed, there, there has to be some lobbying and influencing along the way so that they can uh, put focus also on um, the risk that are brought about by climate change. Uh, but currently, in all candidness, the first order of business is water security first. And uh, probably when we have stabilized already, the next one would be on uh, environmental issues, climate change included. I hope I hope I have answered the question. Yes, so thank you, thank you very much. Yes, uh, sometimes uh, the regulatory cycles are a bit uh, uh, fixed, and that uh, of course is a challenge. Something that we that we have to discuss further. And there is a, a, another question also for for Maria and for Sara about uh, more to the operational side, right? How how have you been able to embed climate resilience and sustainability? In, into utilities operations and how they deliver services. So maybe Sara wants to go first. Oh, Maria, sorry, Mari, 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 because uh, Sara just spoke. Sure, yeah, it's, it's not a simple question either. Of course, this is like many small things over a period of many, many years. There's no single, single person. There's an overall effort, right? So one thing is the ambitions internally, both of the municipality, um, and the goals both for municipality and the country overall, but also the water sector, the Norwegian water sector, kind of our, our national IWA has set a lot of uh, sustainability goals that's been helpful to follow and and streamlining this more and more through our national benchmarking, which, you know, a little bit of competition also helps to raise awareness. Uh, general uh, concerns of the society and general climate change awareness in the society has also been important and also uh, I think there's yeah certain people in, in of course in the organization really more more eager to talk about climate change and start taking initiatives and then gets the ball rolling more and more will also help as well I think it's it's that's 
cannot be underestimated either. Of course, our ISO certifications has helped us also as just overall seeing the mechanism through how everything's so interconnected, right? When you start saving energy, you also save money. And it's, yeah, it's, it's not just only for, for, for environmental reasons, but it's all the sustainability issues are so interconnected with environmental, social and environmental aspects together. And of course, also this, we have a lot of national collaboration projects and new projects, as I mentioned, I think those are the, the main drivers at least. Excellent, thank you. Sara, please, if you could uh, also address a question. Yeah, actually the strategy is same with what uh, Marie has mentioned. Uh, it's a continuing process, embedding sustainability in, in the way that you operate and do business. But I just like probably to add that uh, it, the tone should, uh, the agenda should come from the top. Tone from the top is very important. So it's uh, the leadership that should drive that um, ambition towards um, a more sustainable uh, impact towards the communities and uh, the environment. And uh, once you have the tone from the top, that's the time that you have the, your sustainability programs in place, your social, your environmental, and then your governance also, uh, making sure that you have a, a responsible uh, business uh, that you run. So I guess that's it. Yes, excellent. That's it, but it's not it's not an easy a easy task, right? Not easy. We, no, I think we all agreed agreed on that. Also related to the cost uh, implied, and how to decide on what is uh, right. Uh, uh, also for uh, for Sara, a very uh, direct question about the sensors. Uh, are there are there special sensors for the gases and other dangerous substances? This is a question from Peter uh, Rubik. I uh, sorry, I maybe I I'm not a technical person. I might have to get back on that. I'm sorry, but I'll I'll respond separately. Okay, excellent. Uh, another question: uh, How does the additional energy use and associated uh, greenhouse gases? for anaerobic treatment compared with the greenhouse gases reduced by reducing methane emissions? I don't know if someone can answer this question. So I'll jump in. This is Juliet. I wrote the yes, question. Juliet. Yeah, so it was a question for Sarah. So Sarah, you showed that you've been reducing methane emissions with um, by using aerobic treatment. And I guess aerobic treatment obviously uses a lot more energy than anaerobic treatment. And you must have done some kind of balance. I was interested to hear how they compare of the additional greenhouse gases versus what you save. Like, is it a net reduction? Um, I hope that helps clarify the question a bit better. Yeah, thanks for, thank you for your question. Uh, probably I'll give more light to that on the technical aspect but um, what I know what we do in Manila water is uh, uh, we're a private company but we do the sludging activities from the communal septic tanks of each uh, house so the treatment there releases uh, more uh, methane into the atmosphere so what we what we do is we the sludge uh, every five years um, for that particular household, and then we bring it to our large-scale uh, uh, wastewater treatment uh, facilities, where the the technology is uh, um, can abate uh, the the methane uh, from the that is uh, generated by the household's um, uh, septic tanks. Uh, but uh, yeah, to your point, uh, probably I'll have our technical team uh, explain it in more uh, detail separately. Thank you, thank you. I, I think all, all this trade off only remind us that everything is connected, right? And, and everything is circular. The same like uh, Mr. Foster explained, right? With the, the possibilities to use wrong water and the, the costs associated with that and also the, the energy used. Uh, two more questions, I think, and we and then we will be uh, okay with the time. Are there 
are there any particular technologies used to capture the gases from the wastewater treatment plants? If, if there is anyone who wants to jump in this uh, and to, to reply to this question, I'm happy to give you the floor. I think just to quickly, again, it's not my, my field in detail either, but a lot of it will be reduced as a part of the treatment methods themselves because it will be turned into to solids instead of going to gas as, as a reduction, as, as a process happening in, for example, a recipient or, or in air if it's just being laid there. So I think, I'm not sure if that's what the question was about, but I think when it comes to a lot of greenhouse gas emissions from treatment processes, that's something, there's a lot of research and uncertainties on including also in the recipient. So that's an area we're all looking into and hopefully in a few years we'll have more data on it. Thank you, thank you, Mari. And our last question from Kasuya Naito, it's a question for Sara, it's an interesting question. Manila has a large population and engaged water services in Manila Water and Maniland. Do you work, do, do your company work with money land and the adjacent utilities to address environmental adaptation and mitigation measures? Um, yes, uh, we actually work, uh, at J well, uh, when the utilities were, uh, when the water sector was privatized, uh, the east side of Manila went to Manila Water and the west side is uh, being operated by uh, Mynilad. Uh, but we do um, have that points of, of interaction and also in partnership with our uh, regulators. For example, in terms of uh, watershed, uh, protection. I mentioned earlier that we also involve the indigenous communities. So probably the funding for that actually comes uh, both from Manila Water and uh, Mainiland. So um, uh, aside from that, uh, we always al also discuss uh, our, our plans so that when we um, come to the regulating agency um, as much as possible, our uh, plans in terms of environment and climate action are, are, are aligned. I hope, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think so. Thank you very much, Sara. Uh, okay. Another question for Dr. Foster from Lesego Gaegane. Dr. Foster, how do you protect aquifers when you do carbon storage? Yes, it's an interesting question. Thank you. Um, I mean, basically, the depth range that you're dealing with in water supply from aquifers is relatively shallow, and carbon storage in the subsurface is much deeper. So basically, you're, you're looking at you know, vertical separation and, and, and impermeable layers. I think that's as much as you can say. Um, the parallel question is how do you protect aquifers in general from pollution? Because when they're polluted, you need tertiary treatment and that completely um, pushes up the, the carbon footprint of their use for potable water supply. And this is about getting into land use management. Um, uh, I just give you couple of interesting examples of that from the European Union. I've recently been working with some of the Danish uh, water utilities, and they have an aggressive program uh, on two fronts. One, to reduce per capita water demand through reducing their leakage losses and also uh, making water, uh, water use at the domestic level smaller. And they've got the, they've reduced their in, in one of the major utilities, the Odense utility in the center part of Denmark, they've reduced the average uh, water consumption from about 190 to about 95 liters per day per capita. And then needing less water, they've gone into some programs of reforestation and conversion of agricultural land with compensation to farmers uh, for loss of crops 
funded by national government, the utility and the local government agencies. And these are, this is a good example of, of the way to go to ensure that you don't need uh, uh, advanced treatment uh, uh, of groundwater for potable water supply, which, as I say, is the one factor which will um, completely push up its its, its carbon water uh, footprint. But in terms of carbon storage underground, there's usually a lot of vertical separation between the depths that you use for one and the and the other. Excellent, thank you. I think I think your uh, answer partial partially uh, answered the last question that is also addressed to you. What are the best practices to ensure the sustainability on groundwater? If you want to add a bit more, or yes, I could maybe expand. I think this is probably the most important question of all. Um, but basically, if we're not if we're talking about areas where groundwater is not used for irrigation, first of all because it's, it's simpler there. Um, in this case, it is trying to ensure that the abstraction rates in the long term do not exceed the, the recharge rates. And in general, in quite large areas of Northern Europe and North America, this is, is the case. And uh, so that you do not have continuously falling water levels, because then you've got an unstable situation. You can't design efficient wells and you're constantly uh, facing increased pumping lifts. And then you've got to protect the inner parts of the catchment areas that have been well-defined by specialists. And you do this through uh, dialogue with farmers, changing and modifying farming practices to reduce uh, excess nutrients at times of, 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 of leaching and recharge, at times of excess rainfall, and avoid pesticide pollution. Uh, those are the, the most important um, issues. And the less water you have to protect, the easier it is to do because it implies smaller land areas. If you're in areas where groundwater irrigation is practiced as well, it's a much bigger challenge because easily the largest abstractor and consumer of groundwater is irrigation in these areas. Um, could be Spain, could be California, could be the Midwest in the US, could be Southern Asia, China, etc. And in those areas, you've got to face up to some control over groundwater irrigation, and you've got to have the regulatory agencies focused on long-term sustainability. And the truth is that there's a long way to go on this. This is perhaps the biggest single challenge in groundwater management at, at the present time. Um, uh, we have substantial areas, I say, of uh, India in particular, China to a degree, though they're making significant progress in the last five or eight years there. Parts of the US, a lot of Southern Europe, particularly Spain, and uh, parts of Latin America where uh, there is uh, no balance uh, between groundwater recharge and groundwater use in the long term. As a result, primarily of irrigation, not a public water supply, but the public water supply gets mixed up in, in this cycle and can't escape um, increased pumping costs and so on. Yes, and Dr. Foster, one last, uh, and now it is for real the last question. Okay. What do you think about aquifer research, recharge as a water reuse method? Any concerns on emerging contaminants from treated wastewater? Yeah, I mean, in general, I'm a great advocate of what we call in the specialist area of groundwater management, managed aquifer recharge. That is to say, taking every opportunity to route uh, water into the subsurface uh, wherever possible by land management actions, small land management actions, but down on large scale, uh, across large areas, they're, they're very effective. And there are a lot of good examples of this. When we include wastewater as a source of recharge or downstream of cities, things get more complicated. And they get complicated for the very reason that the questioner suggested. Emerging contaminants are becoming increasingly often found in groundwater systems, particularly shallow groundwater systems, downstream of large cities, partly because they don't get removed in the current treatment processes that uh, many utilities employ. And here, I think much more caution is needed. Um, and in fact, it, in general terms, and I can't always be like this, it is better to uh, 
uh, focus uh, groundwater capture for potable water supply upstream of, of cities and major urban areas and leave the groundwater in the alluvial areas downstream for other uses, particularly irrigation or industrial use. Because at the moment, we don't have a complete, a complete grip on managing the emerging contaminants. And there are some that are be being consistently found in aquifers, certainly down to 50 meters depth. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I feel that because of the because of because of the time, we are going to innovate a bit and to adapt as well. So I give you the floor to Brenda. Thank you very much for all your questions and answers. So Brenda, please, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Carlos. And I would like to say that um, we shouldn't end the questions and discussions over here. Um, as I said during my presentation, we have a platform for the community of practice group on IWA Connect. So please feel free to join the platform and continue the discussions on climate adaptation and mitigation. Um, according to the plan for the meeting, we're supposed to have a second um, discussion where we have some breakout rooms, but um, time has been fast spent. So we are gonna give the floor um, to all of us um, to do have some experience. We want you to share your experiences with us on the topic for the day, which is climate adaptation and mitigation. If you are doing any activity or any project that is related to the topic, um, please feel free to share it with us. And then we have shared with you the activities we have been doing on the COP. So we also like to hear from you if there's any um, further information that you think we could do to further contribute to the community of practice group whether we should be having more webinars, more white papers. And then if you also want to volunteer to lead any activity in the group too, please feel free to let us know and then we will contact you after the meeting. So um, I leave the floor open if anybody has any experience that he or she wants to share with us. And then also any suggestions on how we can improve or contribute further to the development of the COP, please feel free to share with us. Thank you. This is Juliet Willett. I can just share one thing if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm from the University of Technology in Sydney and I am currently uh, finishing off a piece of work that's for the Gates Foundation, which was a landscape study looking at um, particularly climate resilience in low and middle income country, um, urban sanitation. And so it's just to say that that study is, is almost finished. And if there are people who would be interested in that topic and in hearing the findings of that, um, I can put my email in the chat and feel free to get in touch. Um, as I say, the focus is on low and middle income countries and urban sanitation uh, resilience. Okay, That's thank you, Juliet. Me. And That's okay. I also add, add if you have any reports, any um um, papers that you also like to share with a wider community of practice, please feel free to share with me and then I will put it on the page on IWA Connect as well as upload mm -hmm. it on the, um, the Climate Smart web page as well. Okay, that sounds good. We should be ready in another month or so. So I'll, I'll share yeah. things via you, Brenda. Thank you. Okay, thank you too. Um, any other contribution? This is uh, Erika Varga. I'm not from a utility, uh, but we accompany utilities and municipalities with uh, controlled solutions based on artificial intelligence to reduce energy consumption in water management and renewable energy. Uh, and uh, I actually have a question for the audience because uh, I had the feeling that in this webinar or meeting, we heard two case studies where, to my understanding, you struggle more like access water and storm water management. And uh, I was wondering if, uh, if someone from the audience can share a little bit of an insight from uh, areas where they struggle with the opposite. Maybe it's uh, more water stress uh, because uh, I had the feeling that uh, Dr. Foster uh, touched on that topic. But uh, if, you, if anyone can share with some uh, insight or like a little case study. Just in a few sentences. Okay, I know it was not really a contribution and more like a question. Just if there uh, is any brief volunteer for that. Carlos, maybe it's Stephen Foster speaking. Maybe I could at least respond to, to please, that. Please, please. 
uh, not from my direct personal experience, but from the experience of our water, the groundwater management group in the IWA, we've tried to analyze the um, experience of the three big cities where water failure, uh, water system failure has occurred or um, has almost occurred uh, in the last five years or so. Um, and to what extent they uh, you were using groundwater to uh, mitigate the problems that they experienced. And we've, we've, we've done what we can to communicate with Cape Town, with Sao Paulo in Brazil, and with Chennai in India, which I think are the cities that have most suffered uh, uh, on a large scale from water stress and water shortages and, and, and so on in, in, shall we say, in the last five or six years. Uh, our conclusions from that exercise were uh, have been published. I, I, I've got a short paper on it in an IWA, I think it was an IWA outlet, which might be of interest. Um, uh, basically, in Cape Town, they ignored groundwater. They have some substantial usable groundwater that could have been the reserve that um, uh, gave the city much greater resilience, but they'd concentrated all of their investment uh, uh, programs in large surface reservoirs, which, uh, whose yield was much less reliable than they uh, originally anticipated. And so we think that, that that was a case where, and the groundwater is being used by the private sector and there was no uh, water utility uh, use at all. And had there been, and there was plenty of opportunity for it, the situation would have been somewhat more secure. In Sao Paulo, also all of the public water supply comes from um, uh, uh, surface water sources, which were severely strained a few years back. Um, but there are a large number of largely unregulated private water wells, and these users were okay. They were mainly condominium blocks and uh, small industries. Uh, that a those aquifers would not have been suitable for the utility because the yields of wells were not sufficiently reliable and the quality was too patchy. But had the uh, Sao Paulo authorities looked at a larger area, they would have found aquifers that could have continued to supply and uh, during the uh, deficits in their reservoirs. In Chennai, it was uh, the third situation in southern India, uh, more serious, they were using groundwater and surface water sources. The surface water failed completely and the groundwater sources were also, they were not big aquifers, they were fairly thin aquifers. And these were under serious stress and competition with irrigated agriculture. And in the end, the solution was to buy water from farmers and tanker it in. It wasn't very satisfactory, but groundwater played a small role there. So those, the, we have, I say, looked at that experience and written it up, and I can certainly make the uh, uh, reference available via Brenda. Thank you. Excellent. I was actually very interested about that last uh, uh, question because as we learned in Bergen, it rains 3,000 uh, millimeters a year. In my city, Lima, it rains nine millimeters a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that actually are the kind, the, 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 the kind of uh, climate stories that we are trying to collect uh, via this Climate Smart Utilities Initiative and the recognition program that we are running, that we will have a special session during the uh, Congress, to the IWA Congress. We are trying to collect all that different stories from different contexts, uh, different challenges, and uh, as a way as a way to as a way to to incentivize uh, to other other utilities on taking action on climate climate action. Uh, we have only three minutes. Three minutes. Carlos, I didn't realize you come from Lima, but I, I should have also mentioned therefore the example of Lima. Yes, uh, I lived in Lima from 1985 to 1990, oh, uh, working for WHO, but nevertheless got involved locally in the groundwater management. And uh, as you say, it doesn't rain in Lima, no. almost. Um, and the major investment was made in Lima about that time and around in the into the 1990s was to really get conjunctive in your water supply. And major investments were made so that the vast majority of consumers could receive groundwater and surface water. Surface water at first, because it was more readily available, but it's not treatable for part of the year due to mine waste, and then move on to groundwater. And those actions, which were pre the climate 
dialogue, in fact, were very useful in the climate context as well. Uh, fully integrated use, more managed recharge of aquifers, and um, uh, 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 making you know the, the whole system much more resilient than it was in the 1980s and before. Yes, excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you for, 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 for the interventions. Uh, we are only have two minutes, so I would like to invite you to continue. I would like to invite to invite you to continue sharing with us your experiences. As you see, this is a group that we, that is mainly uh, targeting uh, utility. So we are trying to capture applied experiences, right? Implemented actions, uh, and this is of course a challenge. And this is what we are trying to do via the Climate Smart Utilities Initiative. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Foster, for your interesting presentation about the possibilities of uh, using groundwater. I, I think the main the main uh, takeaway there is to try to keep the carbon 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 footprint low and for that we will need more regulation to avoid to prevent pollution because otherwise maybe it doesn't make uh, economic sense the, the use of wrong water right Absolutely. and also to the to the to the two presenters about our case stories our case studies uh, really uh, showing us how they managed to implement uh, actions uh, from the utility point of view in order to uh, deal with this increased uncertainty that climate change is bringing to, to all of us, right? Uh, we are uh, happy to have these stories and we would like to collect more of these stories. Uh, so please, uh, I, I invite you to continue engaging with us via this community of practice, one of the pillars of the main uh, components of our initiative. And I also please invite you to share with your colleagues about the opportunity to showcase your climate actions during the IWA Congress and be aware that we have 10 grants to support utilities who wants to present their, their, their climate action in the Congress from developing countries, right? And uh, we will be very happy to review your applications. And I think that the only thing I have to say is thank you very much to, for, to all of you. Please continue being engaged and see you next time. Thank you. Gracias. <laughs>